Are you feeling stifled, worn out, or just bored with your nine to five or nine to nine job? I want you to know that you're not alone. I was there too, till I started asking and wondering if there was another way to live and work where I could actually be more of me. In this episode, I bring to you real conversations with real people who have chosen to step out of their nine to five employment and create a life for themselves that is more in line with their inner rhythm. Hi, Abhishek. Hello. Hello, Ramya. Good evening. And thank you so much for coming and agreeing to talk about your story as part of this uh, episode. And, um, you know, I'm fascinated by your journey and which is why I have you here, but um, the audience knows nothing about you. So I'm going to ask you, so we're going to go chronological here and I'm going to take you back and I'm going to ask you to go back as much as you want to, perhaps to your, you know, being a gold medalist at, in your MBA at IM Bangalore. You can go back till then or even before that and take us through your journey and uh, in terms of your thinking about your work, your career at that point, what was it like? What did you do as the first step from then? Well, as back as I can remember, uh, lovely. Yeah, so uh, I mean, just all the way from school to IIM, I can just trace a single thread of like maxing out life. Like, you know, this is one life, let's just max it out, let's give it our best. Uh, in school, it manifested as me participating in everything I could and being head boy and being top of class. And that kind of moved into college where I was writing books and getting my best student and best speaker and uh, doing college festivals. And that kind of continued all the way to IAM. I, if I have to like summarize it in one kind of thread, I would say the the deep belief was that this is like, one life and I want to max it out and I want to have all the possible experiences I can. And I, as in Hindi, we say, kasar nahi chodni hai. Jine mein koi kasar nahi chodni hai. Wow. Puri time. Right. And uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was the younger version of me. I love it. I love my 20 year old, 21 year old self because uh, of course he, he has his own edges and his own arrogance and so on. But that's granted because uh, my 21 year old self is also achieving, doing well, maxing out my IIM journey was also like an example of maxing it out doing two or three societies and doing well in ACADS and a campus relationship and an exchange program and like yeah the work so so yeah I would say I've just generally been a maximizer I guess and uh, even today I would say that yeah I, I love that you know the word maxing out and I'm going to hold that as we go through your journey because even you know within that there is the what am I maxing out you know the mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, feeling, yeah. the takeaway yeah. the yeah. Uh, yes. diversity of choices or the depth or yes. the yes. you know Absolutely. and, and I'll, I'll let you I know I know you will take us into different ways in which you've been maxing out your life mm -hmm. and uh, so what happened after I'm so I graduated out of IIM with uh, my gold medal and very proud and happy and clear that I don't want to take the corporate route. Tell us why. So what was your thinking then? So you're the second year student, you're the gold medalist and, and you decide not to sit for placement. Like almost everybody goes to IIM in order to sit for placement. So take us through your thinking because... You know, I was an IM, I was IM for a placement. I was there to learn. Honestly, I was there to really learn. And I really enjoyed learning at IM with some of the most amazing profs. Uh, I was there to learn. And I was clear about that. I think for me, I am a stoic at heart. And it's like, what if you die tomorrow kind of a thing, right? And that time I was still being shaped. Now I'm even more like, you could die any moment. And so do what you really love. At that time, I remember talking to one of my friends and saying, you know what, why don't I get a couple of years of experience and then maybe I'll do my own thing. And this friend just very casually asking, what if you die at the end of the second year uh, of uh, of your job? And it was a casual question, but really landed. I was like, ouch, that would suck that I postponed what I wanted to do for even two years. Like, why? So I was very clear that I want to do what I want to do and I don't want to wait. Maybe now when I look at my past self, maybe I should have waited, taken some experience. But at that time, I was like, very, let's go for it kind of a thing. 
So I was very clear I wanted to do my own thing. I really wanted to follow my own voice. That voice at that time was to do personal growth work for young people. Um, and uh, I just felt a job would not give me that. My summer internship was enough for me. I had two months of a full-time corporate job. And I was like, this is not what I want to do. It was some of, one of the best internships on campus. It was in Singapore. It was an investment bank. It had everything that a good uh, internship would have. So you and got the it, sample, right? And the sample was... The sample. You got the sample... <laughs> And it yeah. was enough to tell you, okay. It was no. a great sample because it made me clear I don't want to be abroad. I want to be in India. I miss India. I love my motherland. So that whole patriotic side in me was there. There was a lot of money. So it was very clear that money is not driving me because I'm like, that's it. So it was good in a way that I could falsify a lot of assumptions about yeah. myself. Yeah. That left it very clear. <laughs> yeah. Fair kya hua. Yeah. So, 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 and, and so then what did you do? What did you set up? deferred placements by a year uh, i set up something called thakur learning center this was inspired a lot by deepak chopra at that time chopra wow. learning center so i was like thakur learning center still very self help very like yeah it was very art of living very deepak chopra very transcendental meditation reiki and you know all of that and anthony robbins of course how can i forget a lot of anthony robbins so wow. to take all this to young people uh, right, uh, did some summer camps, did some workshops, and uh, we had a coaching classes business which was pre MBA. That was, anyways, also continuing. Uh, I had Blue Ribbon, my NGO that I had started again pre MBA that was continuing. So I entered into that like full blast uh, with a full joy, uh, only to be met with a very difficult world. Suddenly, the world seemed very difficult. I was like, what just happened? Like, I was cruising all along, and how did things get so tough? Like, what happened? So I was I was really taken aback by my own first failure, I would say. Uh, so that? What the happened? venture not working out, the venture simply not being able to take off and support uh, the three of us who were doing it. it uh, and we having very less patience with it. Now I look back, I was like, we were too soon to judge ourselves as failures. And in fact, by that metric as a startup, we were doing really well. I guess nobody advised us to stay on or maybe we didn't have the right advisors. So we kind of quit a little too early. Uh, and the staying power of my partners was very less because they were from financially more challenging conditions. Then leaving left me alone and so on. I hit a little bit of a depressive phase, in fact, uh, and right oh, after. Abhishek, I'm, I'm just going to go back to Blue Ribbon, mm -hmm. something that you started even before your MBA. Mm -hmm. So uh, was that something you started by yourself or with someone else? And me that and was a group still of friends. Yeah, yeah, me and a group of friends started. Okay. And yeah. that was still continuing, right? That is still continuing in its third version. Yeah. No, at, and at that time as well. And do you want to give us like, you know, a one line, two line summary of what Blue Ribbon's about? Because I know it's going to play a parallel thread in your journey. Yeah. It's always been about realizing human potential through social impact, through making a change in the world. It's about self-transformation while showing up in the world and making that a better place. Uh, so it's really building leadership for a better world. That's how we call and, it. And this is something that you had connected with even before your MBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Before and MBA. yeah, okay. So I'm holding this in parallel. And this this venture, the Thakur Learning uh, Center, Center, right, was the, the next one. Again, I see the yeah. aim of both of them. Very similar, right? Very, Very aligned. Yeah, yeah. And then, Except Thakur Learning yeah. Center was yeah. more personal growth. Blue Ribbon was more social change. And now my work has kind of combined. Brought these I would say this crash of 2006 for me was quite heavy because uh, everything crashed. Like uh, even Blue Ribbon shut down because I had taken my energies onto uh, the venture. The venture crashed. So it was a tough time, like a seriously tough time uh, for me. The crash of 2006 in that way, yeah. Like I said, it was my first failure. I, I, I wish I would have failed earlier. I hadn't. Let's 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 talk a little about that, Abhishek. Um, and uh, just to, you know, for me and all our listeners, to all of us to milk what we can from your failure experience. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much learning there, right? So um, do you want to tell us what it felt like? And when you say, I wish I'd failed earlier, clearly there was something that you got out of that failure also. So what are those... Uh, what are those uh, gifts there? And what, what were the pains? And how did you overcome those pains? Be and, and I ask this because so many of us 
I mean, the thing that we fear the most is failure. And the more mm -hmm. conversations we can have about that, real mm -hmm. raw conversations, I just think it's going mm -hmm. to make it easier. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I think uh, one is I hadn't failed because I had like I was really cruising all my school, college, and B school like out and out, like almost no major okay. failure. Jet plane. Yeah, yeah, I was like yeah. uh, flying. Uh, so suddenly, when I went into the world, I think the number of variables suddenly increased, and I didn't realize that I was in a way more complex environment than my B school. B school is a much easier environment, right? You have very clear variables of success, and you can hack it. You can work around it. Suddenly, when you're left in the wilderness of the world, there's just so much complexity and it was way more complexity than I could deal with at that time. I took on too much complexity. The complexity of continuing Blue Ribbon with Thakur Learning Center, bringing in two of my friends into it and doing something that was still very ahead of its time, which was summer camps for personal growth. And so I, I really took too much of a leap. And when that kind of complexity, neither could I manage nor could the venture manage. Like, like it was, it was taking too much of a leap and because of that leap, our core business also shrunk. We were relying on our coaching class and that also shrank. So it was, uh, it was a whole domino effect of everything crashing. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was nothing like failure to ground you, I guess, to bring you back to the ground <laughs> so after the flight to come back and meet yourself in a, in a difficult place. Uh, so yeah, so it grounded me, I would say. And it, it also uh, took me into depression. But at that time, I didn't know it was depression. That was like the unfortunate part. Like I was depressed. I think my first traces of depression were probably in my summer internship when I was away from India and feeling very alienated. Then it came again and I still didn't know it was depression. Because I was all positive thinking and like, how can a positive thinking, uh, you know, Norman Vincent Peale and Dale Carnegie guy be, uh, be low? Uh, so yeah, so it, it did it did affect me quite uh, quite badly uh, in that. And how did you how did you pull yourself out of that? So what were the resources, support systems inside you, outside you, learning? So that, yeah, that was still very easy, you know, Ramya. Like there is a bigger failure coming up with the story, but I mean, this one was. <laughs> I mean, I have a B-school degree, I have a gold medal, I have networks of friends, all I need to do is to reach out to them. And uh, the next thing I knew, I had interviews with some great consulting firms and I was already employed with one of them. Uh, so I, it was just for me to say that this is not working, which I was refusing to say. I had postponed my placements. At that time, the institute gave you an option to defer placements, but I didn't even take the deferred ones because I was like stubbornly trying. At some but stage, you, but you still say, got into BCG. That was out of that. That was not from campus. That was, uh, uh, yeah. So it was at some stage me just saying, this is not working, you know, and this is against all the self-help. Self-help teaches a lot of, you know, do not quit and you shall succeed. But at that time, I think quitting, finally, I had to say, okay, that is not true. Sometimes one has to quit because what you're doing is not working. You're banging your head against a wall. Mm -hmm. So it took me a while and humility, right? Like, how could I fail kind of a thing? You know, there's like newspaper articles about me when I was quitting placements and I was like, how could I fail? So that whole accepting that I have not been able to make this work. And of course, each failure is a founding stone for a future success. So obviously it is also training. Life prepares you for what, you know, so uh, what you're ultimately called to do. So I think every failure is a preparation for cleansing. I think it's inner cleansing. Failure is inner cleansing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you know, Abhishek, I'm going to ask you um, to answer this both from your current self and from what age were you then? 23, 24. 24, yeah, 24. 24, right? So, uh, you know, the sense of I am doing something and I, this thing failed, this business didn't run and I failed in doing it. <laughs> and the framing of this didn't work, but I'm still not a failure or <laughs> I'm a failure because I couldn't make this work. Mm -hmm. So how was it then for you, you know, the sense making of that and how is it now? So as in how much, uh, you know, did you personalize the failure of the venture or business with? Only yes. a bit, I would say I didn't fully personalize it because I still had a lot of self-esteem left from that whole flight that I had taken. Mm -hmm. So it was still at the end of it. And then once I got placed into a consult firm, it was the the whole sort of thing was back, right? Esteem was back. Lovely. So uh, so I didn't thankfully personalize it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get up and get off uh, on, yeah. on things, right? So I didn't personalize. Today's self, 
is like I don't even know if there is failure in life anymore. Like <laughs> yeah, I don't think I know. Is like non-existent. There is nothing yeah. like failure at all. There is yeah. definitely nothing like failure. There is uh, just, just the label. Point. Yeah, yeah. One of the most useless labels, in fact, right? It's just yeah. I mean, I feel very yogi perfect. now. I am totally like a karmi yogi. I'm like keep doing it's it's okay. worthwhile. Yeah, you plant seeds and some of them grow and some yeah. of them won't and. Absolutely. Doesn't make the seed or you any less because absolutely yeah so, yeah yeah okay lovely so you went to BCG फिर क्या हुआ then I had my real kind of failure or I would say tragedy not failure because it's not in my hand which was when I got diagnosed with bipolar bipolar disorder and this was a manic phase that hit me right uh, in the in the middle of my first six months on my job and that was two thousand seven the time when mental health was like nowhere in conversation i never heard of the term bipolar like by the time i regained my consciousness i was in a sort of mental asylum just recovering in those like brown uniform and rainy season uh, and before that I, i it was all blurred so i was suddenly like in the middle of nowhere <laughs> with a blurred memory and with everything and there everything really crashed because there i realized that now i don't know if i can go back to work my relationship Well, went through a, its own stress. I had alienated friends. That was serious stuff. Like that was really hard. That uh, I think there I could see my whole thing break and crumble. That whole edifice that I had built, everything just completely crash. So that was that was hard. And I would say that wasn't a failure because I did nothing to will it on myself. That was just plain tragedy. Like that was almost like life picking on me and giving me like throwing a huge serious challenge at me. Wow. Uh, yeah. unexpectedly yeah and and unfairly also at that time and even still i feel like uh, i mean tragedies are unfair you no know, by their very nature we don't uh, but yeah that's life so i think that was that was hard yeah and um what what were the you know you've risen from that and mm-hmm. you're continuing to craft and navigate your life in what i think is really a beautiful beautifully graceful contributive way but we'll come to that so so what is it and not everybody but he does that i'm sure you know people and i know people when tragedy strikes i know quite a few people in fact at uh, close quarters where you know tragedy strikes and it strikes and that's it uh, hmm. they don't really rise up again hmm. so hmm. what helped you rise up Inner resources, outer resources. Yeah. No, just one word: patience. I was ah. just able to. My thoughts were also clouded because I had received like shock therapy and I was under heavy medication. I couldn't even think clearly. But I think one thought I was able to hold on to was just be patient. Like just be patient. This will pass. So I think the all my self help and gyan everything disappeared or got nichoed into just one thought. That just. Be patient. We'll sort this out. Just, just stay on. Like it's okay. I think for the next three years, I was just rebuilding life and coming back to normal. Uh, and it's, it was just a matter of that whole slow patience, day after day, just walking, just improving, just solving one knot at a time, recovering. So it took me uh, a few years just to come back on my feet. Uh, and yeah. And, and Abhishek, I can't tell you how. I mean, I really want to give it to you here, you know, because the, if I may use the word kindness and caring with which you helped yourself get back on your feet, because to go back to the eighteen-year-old, twenty-one-year-old Abhishek who really wanted to max it out, and at one level, maxing out also comes with the sense of time and speed and yeah, as many yeah. things in parallel as fast as you can, right? That's that's yeah. sort of yeah. the very engineering definition of maxing out, right? Yeah, yeah. when yeah. time is so. you know you want to do as much as and from there to say i'm going to take it slow i'm going to be patient i'm going to give myself the time and the recovery and the space i need to so hats off that you could make that thank you make that yeah yeah thank you and take yeah. us into the next phase what happened after those three years and that so in my recovery phase i joined another consulting firm just to find my feet but once i recovered i went back to my original promise because now it was even more clearer to me that life is short and anything can happen so it's like now like no time pass at all 
like now uh, now showing up for what i really want to do and blue ribbon is still there and blue ribbon was my love my life i guess so <laughs> uh but so that blue ribbon shut down in 2005 the first version mm-hmm. so i restarted it as a social enterprise okay. uh around 2010 and i said this is what i would like to it's do still the same vision right empowering youngsters to become yes i mean broadly that and it of course the model had shifted from a youth collective to a social enterprise that would provide some training also do some work on gender on civic engagement so the thinking uh, got upgraded and uh, got started with blue ribbon while continuing my some of my corporate training facilitation work which i totally enjoyed at that time uh, so that was also also that kept me in touch with the corporate world uh, which has its own value i think just being in touch with that energy that work ethic that focus that sharpness so uh, yeah so i think then uh, it was a social enterprise zone all the way for the next uh, 8 10 years yeah yeah and um, tell, tell tell us a bit about you know that period of your life and how you connected with your work at that time oh like social enterprises your equation. yeah your equation with the work that you were doing yeah yeah no social enterprises are really hard because uh, i feel as entrepreneurs your failure rate is very high but if you succeed you get paid off handsomely uh in social enterprises failure rate is very high and if you succeed whatever good happens happens to the society like you don't you don't make your bank you sure get credibility you get seen you so get what known. kept you in it for that many years oh the deep belief that this is what the world needs like deep belief that if there is someone like me with my experiences my privilege my gifts then i want to be a soldier in the army of the lord if i put it that way like i i felt really called to serve i was like this is what the country needs this is what the world needs uh, and i just became more and more sure of it uh, so that kept me going just seeing suffering of people around and just seeing the huge gaps in some of these areas right and and how far we are from the world we dream of uh, during those years i also had a lot of chance to travel extensively the environment movement uh, 2012 was the rio summit and so a lot of my uh, activism work went international trying to lobby the un and work for the environment and do a lot of connecting across the world also with a shared dream so i really i think the dream caught me the dream of a better world another world uh, really Sorry, caught me i see i you know i see that light and that twinkle <laughs> in your eyes as you say this which um, according to me is very rare and precious i want to see that twinkle i want everyone to have access to that their version of that twinkle and you use the word dream three four five times right now my dream of the world i dream of the world we dream of the shared dream so tell us tell me a little describe that world that you dream of the one that you're oh. drawn to work towards building <laughs> i feel i live in the world i dream of you know it's filled with beautiful things for myself mm-hmm. uh including conversations with friends including a lot of opportunities to contribute including being able to talk to my daughter and say i tried like i know it's not looking great but trust me i tried but uh, for me the dream of the world is more a process now rather than an outcome rather than a utopia i've realized that the process of arriving That's at so the nice. okay i'm going to double that and quote and idealize because many times we think dream has to be like this final destination dream right yeah. but the dream can be a process also so the dream great. yeah the dream is a process i think more and more the moment i crystallize the dream into something it almost becomes violent to the present moment because the present moment has moved on and i crystallize the dream from a past self so a crystalline I can i repeat that the moment you crystallize a dream it becomes it can become violent. Violent. it can become right a or a dishonoring and... of the present moment because yeah. that was past self in the past yeah. beautiful yeah so i see it as a constant negotiation between my past present and future selves they're talking to each other all the time to figure what right it's not and like the past present and future reality outside also right the yes one. yes absolutely absolutely yeah so so for me uh, i don't know if i have a dream of the world as much as living uh, yeah this is a tough one for me to answer ironically because uh, or paradoxically because there are so many visions for a more beautiful world so i think there is no dearth of visions i think what i have learned is the future has to be birthed in the now that's the world you can't walk to the future you to bring the future into the present so if i want a future where 
friends can leisurely sit and have meaningful conversations that i need to live that future now so as you and i are in this conversation i feel like yes i want this is future for me living between us we want so many friends like this to sit and have these conversations so we are bringing a slice of the future into the present and to me that is the work abhishek i love this i and let's stay with this this is so i i, I can't tell you how much i resonate with this right and tell me if i'm getting this uh, in the way you meant it which is um you know instead of dreaming of this future saying kabhi kabhi or you know some day sometime i will have it this way sort of just uh, connecting with the essence of that and having it now living it now being it now really yeah being it yeah 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 wow the essence of it yeah 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 and yeah can i level it up one more or yes it... yes yes go for you it no i i feel what wants to be born is constantly looking for channels Mm-hmm. And if you make yourself the channel for that to be born, right? That is the work. Like even whether you are an entrepreneur or just going to a podcast, if there are people who are wondering whether I should do a job or not, or it's like what you are searching is also searching for you. And one approach is the hustler approach of go and find and crack it out. The other is to just trust that there is something waiting to be born through you. And if only you stop like gasping and pedaling and and just let be and just allow to come you know these ideas are flirting all the time they want places where they can land there's a competition of what wants to be born and we are the gatekeepers of that living on the planet so i feel if you if you get yourself to be a channel for what wants to be born i think that's how you birth the future now you choose what you want as a possibility to be born through you so yeah i think that's that right. no yeah. i i i love the way you ex, uh, express that and i'm just going to tie this in with the maxing theme that i picked up on from you and you know the analogy that's just coming to my mind now is like one way of maxing is the hustling and the doing and you're doing a lot of things another way of maxing your experience or creation or being part of what's happening is actually slowing down and spacing out and becoming that channel or vessel because there's already so much happening it's like life is there there there's a lot happening and now you can allow that to happen through you yes and and that's how you actually max out what you're being yes or yes. allowing yes and your local ingredients which is your personality your circumstances your history create a very unique soil which is not present anywhere else so of all the floating seeds some seeds will land and sprout only in your being they're not going to sprout elsewhere nice abhishek you know? <laughs> let's talk more a little more about that uniqueness okay mm. that uh, you know what you just talked about as every one of us being this completely unique and and about the fact that there are possibilities or you know you use some other word i forget what it was but uh yeah uh, sounded like yeah whispers of possibility or creation that can land only on you because it's looking for your soil mm mm-hmm. and uh tell us more about that through your life my life is <clears throat> so what uh, are you being the yeah. soil for because that's how you know that's how you see all of us that's how you see yourself so right now So if we fast forward you now to your life what you're doing what are you being this soil this birthing ground this vessel and channel for I think my life is about holding privilege humbly you know i started out with a bunch of privileges and totally cruised on them and then was humbled by life uh, and that was my first and only marginalization experience to be mentally ill i don't know what it is to be a woman i don't know what it's to be uh, from a different caste or a religion or you know so i'm a privileged person by all accounts except this mental health thing and that somehow adds that color you know that imperfection to the whole thing which makes it so real for me so so then i i stand as a possibility of what one can do with privilege 
right? I've had so much privilege and I've had the choice to put that privilege to some use. And I think I've, I've had that possibility, that opportunity to open myself up and say, okay, here's my privilege and I'm not going to use it exclusively for myself. I'm going to make it available to the collective, to my community, my country, to the world. And like, okay, what do you want to do with me, God, now? Like, I'm available. I'm on your team. Place me, give me, use me. You know, it's like almost like I've told life, use me. And when I do that, there is so much that wants to be born that I can feel that energy of so much that's wanting to be born. So today, in what I'm doing, there is something related to the city and our municipal elections, which wants to be born. And there is something which is around building evolutionary leadership and culture for NGOs that wants to be born. There's a centrist movement idea that wants to be born. So, so to me, I think, but yeah, if I bring it back to what is that soil, uh, that soil is my life experiences of privilege and the the dip of, wow. of mental health. Uh, my urban my urban upbringing, you know, I'm a Mumbaiker, out and out, city boy. <laughs> so for me to realize and go from the city to both the world and the hinterland to expand that. And so, yeah, so, so I feel like a fertile place where new ideas, new possibilities, people just keep flirting, keep coming, keep showing up. And uh, yeah, and uh, it's one full dance. I don't even think of it as rational tick tick tick. I think of it as a flu. That's that's so nice. I yeah. love that. I love the way you describe that birthing ground. And uh, so something that I noticed, Abhishek, when you were talking about the projects, about the things, right? You lit up. You expanded. Like your body language expanded. Okay. And the vision I got was like, it's like because. You're trying, not trying, trying is not a good word to do, but because you're actually working for, you know, it sounds very cliche, but I'm just going to say it in the cliche way, good, working yeah. for the betterment of large bodies of people, right? Not a small project. You're talking about a municipal mm -hmm. project. Like, I'm sure it's it's like a big thing, right? Like it's many right. people involved, <laughs> more, more than more than like the kitchen garden, for example, right? Yeah, so, so the bigger these projects are, the more the people who would be impacted by what you're doing, would it be fair to say, and just going by all the your experience, because I know you've had a wide range of experience, right? From management consulting to your own training firm, to the facilitation, to corporate workshops, to Blue Ribbon, to what you're doing now. So would it be fair to say that the more people you're trying to impact, the more energy you can actually um, pull in or flow and invite to come through you? Does your capacity increase as well? My capacity increases with depth, Ramya, I've found. So I've realized I'm not a scale person. Okay. What I do are also very tiny projects compared to the scale of the problems. And they're symbolic. They're experimentative. They're edgy. They're unique. They're awesome. I love them. Uh, and they're tiny. They're not those huge large scale projects because that's just not innately my prakriti. It's almost like it's not my prakriti. I've received it fully. And that goes against my India bringing that <clears throat> believes in scale. But I, for me, the small is beautiful is so true for me. As I go deeper, by deeper, I mean in terms of my connections with my ancestors, ancestral energies of Gandhi or Vinoba or the first human explorer. So as I go deeper there, wow. I go further into future generations. Like, am I answerable to people who have not yet been born? I think, yes, I'm answerable to those who have not been born. Right. So as I expand that perspective, as I dig deeper into my own being, I think those are spaces from where the clearing happens. Oh Those, my God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is not just about like, you know, what I thought was impacting lots of people like head counts. What you're talking about here is the depth of what you're bringing. And I'm also seeing the time element come in, right? So mm -hmm. drawing yeah. and connecting from, yeah, the ancestral energies. I That's quite beautiful. And, and looking to contribute and leave a legacy or create something for the future generations yeah. that are not even born wow so so just bear with me here so if i'm seeing this just now i'm sort of wearing a psychologist's hat here so right you know in terms of framing it in your mind when you frame it as this really really long-term project that started way before you were born and that's yeah. ending way yeah. after you're going to die <laughs> or never ending and yeah. i'm getting goosebumps right so does yeah, 
I, I guess that just uh, makes it more powerful for you than yeah. just thinking of the eye. You know, the small eye that we talked about, <laughs> as in the Thakur uh, company, mm. because that's a more small. It's a. Yeah. It's yeah. just the eye, right? It's just every shape's life, and uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. Does that, and it must be feeling different when you work for that long. Oh, absolutely, I think it means two things for me. Uh, if we call this project humanity or whatever, hmm. I think one, I feel it is each of our duty to enjoy the gifts our ancestors have worked so hard for. You know, and uh, when I look at Ananya, my daughter. I'm like, I want her to enjoy the stuff I have brought because that's when a parent feels great, you know. And I'm that... going to ask you a very difficult question here, okay? Um... So should I just complete one yes, this yes. part saying yeah, that, yeah. that I think our ancestors have struggled and tried and explored and they've, they've really worked hard for us to enjoy what we're enjoying today. And I receive it with a lot of gratitude and with a birthright. Like, that's my legacy. It's my legacy to enjoy the human experience in the 21st century. So that's kind of one part. And the other part is that I'm a speck in this large project humanity where I, while I'm alive, I can do whatever, whatever minuscule piece and that's not even doing, it's a happening. I'll do that. So I think those two are the corollaries of this stretching. Wow. Yeah, so okay. so this question. is a difficult question. And I, I like it, you know. I, I almost wanted to make notes and then I realized we're recording this and I can rewind and play that part again. But um, so how have you not fallen into or do you fall into? Because I fall into this a lot and I know many others do of getting angry with our ancestors, getting and blaming them and feeling really mad at our ancestors for messing up society, messing up institutions, for creating such an unfair world, for spoiling the planet, for mm. creating all these stupid schooling systems that are saying stupid, you know. Okay. And like, I, and I'm just sort of really like the rhetoric in my brain, and I know it, I'm not alone. I see this um, with others also. I, I do see a dominant rhetoric of, being angry and uh, not really liking what our ancestors have created for us. And I, I, I mean, I found it really touching to hear your perspective, which is one of gratitude. And um, did you always have only that or have you worked? Did you also have the anger and the all in, injustice and all? And did you not injustice, but I think anger of you guys have been so stupid and you messed up society. <laughs> there we were living in the forest during caveman times and look what you've done. And then did you work? have to work through that other rhetoric? I mean, during my climate change and climate activism days, naturally one feels angry about the previous generations. Uh, you know, in the 70s, that Brundtland report was there. Nobody read it. And 30 years later, we were still protesting for climate change. And even after us, Greta Thunberg is doing it. So those days, yes. I think over time it has evolved into such deep gratitude. Like I'm, I'm really being honest here. Like I, I feel like when I die, I'm going to meet the Gandhis and Vinobas and Krishnamurtis of the world. And I'm just like, I just hope I don't go there with a hanging head, but I look at them and smile. And I said, like, I tried, like, I wow. didn't let you down. I did what I could. I built on what you gave us. I really tried. Like I, I did my best, you know, I'm, I, I, it really drives me, you know, this thought, Thing. Am I going to go and get slapped? Am I going to be hanging my head in shame? Or am I going to be able to look at them in the eye and say to the best of my understanding, whatever you did. And the more I engage with their work, I realize how hard they tried, how thankless. Like it's so beautiful what they've left for us. You know, uh, so yeah. So I think to me, ancestral energies and just grounding this back to the intent of our podcast, right? Like when individuals uh, are choosing questions of their career and so on, I feel tapping into our legacy is so important. Your father's story, your grandfather's story, your grandmother's story, the story of your community. Like there are gems there which will inspire you today. Saying, oh, I belong to this community. For generations, our community has done X. And that memory is there in your DNA. When you set out to do something, you, you remember it. There's a cultural memory of your ancestors having done something. It's just like, I don't know why we don't factor it in. <laughs> like, I think, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm, thinking, I'm not letting you off this call, okay? <laughs> I, because there's something here now, I'm 
you know, I just, I want to learn this from you. Absolutely. Right here, right now. I'm going to max out this call. Uh, and I want, you know, is there anything you can do to help a person like me? And then through me, the others, viewers listening also, make this switch or have access to this opening that you have. Because I see it's precious. And, you know, wearing the hat of a researcher, like, you know, in science and in positive psychology, and all, I know there's merit. There's so much merit to being able to wed this, the gratitude lens with the legacy and ancestral energy and the collective, if I may say. It's not that I have to do everything myself, but, you know, I have millions of people behind me who, and I'm just taking their work forward. And I'll be completely honest with you. I've not tapped into this at all. Like on a scale of zero to 10, for me, it's a zero. And I'll also tell you um, a little about some of the work that I do a lot <laughs> on myself and enabling others. And this sounds, and I, I know it's not bad, but it sounds, it's, it's different. It's, it's coming from a freedom perspective where I've done work with ancestral with my ancestors, but the work has all been about, and I use the word separating and decoupling, not in a sad way, but in a happy way, freeing myself from my mm -hmm. past, freeing myself from the illusions, the myths, the, you know, the famines, the starving, the, a lot of stuff, which was true for them, but no longer true for me and just freeing, like breaking all the karma, if I may say, right? and thereby liberating or freeing myself. And in the career space, like even in MBA courses that I teach, like I make these kids and youngsters do what I call the stakeholder exercise where they learn to you know, uh, recognize and separate and identify their dreams from that of their father and mother and aunt and uncle and society and grandfather. You know, so that uh, the kind of breaking up of all the ties and cords for freedom. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just realizing now in this conversation that in all that search and quest and movement towards freedom, there's something that I've potentially completely not <clears throat> paid attention to, which is also the carrying forward the gifts and the support yeah, and the legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how to, what have you done in this space? I'm sure you've done something here. So take us through that. Take me and anyone else. What can we do here? I have massively individuated first. <clears throat> I've rebelled uh, with my parents in terms of saying, I will just do social change work. I'll follow what I want to do. So I've had a very strong I in my early 20s, for sure. Uh, and I think B-School experience also strengthens the I a lot. And post my bipolar, that I kind of broke, right? It broke and I had to rebuild it from scratch. And as I was rebuilding it, I got connected with the struggles of others and that I was not as rigid and strong. I, it was a mm. softer I. And then as I open up that I without my self defenses or without getting too preoccupied with myself, like what is mine? What is not mine? I'm like, who am I? And I'm just like a space where things are coming, going. And as I open myself up to those experiences, as I open myself up to those energies, as I go deeper into my experience of being a parent, my experience of being a son, a whole intergenerational dynamic kind of opens up, you know, and uh, I mean, that can be a whole different podcast on just what across generations, the business across generations, you know, and I think individuation is just a interim step, which is very necessary. And you're enabling that for people. I, I would not bypass it. it. Otherwise, it's like a bypass. Yeah. No, thank you. It just, it... Yeah. It clicked. I, I get it. And and I think, yeah, without the individuation, you're still all tied up and you don't know who is you, who is, whose yeah, dreams absolutely. are you living, whose fears are you carrying. So thank you for that. And I realize, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I see what you went through through your bipolar experience as actually a gift that broke you open. Yeah. And uh, of course, I don't wish it on everyone because I know it's been very, it's, it's, yeah. it's a tough experience. It's a hard experience. I don't wish it. But I'm also wondering how we can create some of that for ourselves without having to go through that pain of breaking mm -hmm. the ego that life took you through. Because at some level, we have to do it 
in order to be able to tap into that next yeah. step post the individuation, right? Yeah. Because yeah. I know how to help people individuate. I know how to help. I have sort of become very good at that now. But for that next step, and I think that's the window I'm looking for, you found it. And I guess we'll maybe next, we'll, I'll, I'll keep this question alive in my head on how we can all find yeah. Access to our answers. Yeah, there's a lot of work there. Yeah. I mean, there's grieving, there is asking for forgiveness, there is actually forgiving. There's a lot of work in that zone. All of it helps the person trying to find their own quest. Yeah. And, and I think there's also um there's also something around that uh desire element itself. Like you kept speaking about a shared dream, dream for humanity, right? So as long as my dreams and desires are still for me, I'm going to find it difficult to even wear that shared lens. Mm, yeah. Right? So, so in some way, when the dream is for the collective, then I think yes, it yes. allows you to draw from the collective in yeah. order for your dream, which is for the collective. But yeah. if my dream is still my yeah. dream, then I'll yeah. be drawing only from me, right? So yeah. yes, there's, yes, some, there's some next step there also. And I'm guessing it's, yeah, yeah it, like whoever goes there, goes there. So yeah. 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 <laughs> but I'm so glad that you went there and I'm so glad that you're having this conversation to us. So it's not just like this whole, you know, like this, hey, we, you know, like we hear about these cliches, but I'm glad to have you here as the walking, talking embodiment of someone who's doing that collective dream, collective contribution and channeling that thing. So thank you so much. Uh, okay, so before you leave, I want you to, so the viewers of this podcast or this series is really, you know, what I'm uh, trying to open up to people is examples of uh different ways of living life, different ways of going through this thing called career and work and living with ourselves and our work beyond just the traditional employment. And uh, so if there are people who are looking at that, your top three pieces of advice, tips, wisdom, I know you may not like these words, I know, but yeah, I'm happy to do it. say whatever you feel like I'm saying. Original self-help person, I'm very yes. happy to do, I think. The first I would say is engaging your own appetite for complexity and biting only what you can chew. I think most people who are making these leaps take on way more complexity than they can handle. Uh, not only from a career. And how, how can people gauge their own appetite for complexity? And at one level, it's very simple, right? Like, oh, if your relationship or marriage is breaking down or you've just had a child or if your parents are super ill and you need to be there for care, to care for them and you're going out to start a venture, with, I mean, you are like, it's it's a very, at one level, it's very commonsensical to see, I'd even calculate, uh, I'd even try to create a complexity calculator at one stage for people to know how complex their life is. I know it must be somewhere filed away, it never got complete. It's not very tough to see complexity. If you're struggling to keep up with life, if the juggling balls are dropping, you're juggling too many balls. One extra ball is juggling. Two, three extra is like, about to fall. And you want a juggler. Yeah. So like, what's your capacity to juggle? That can keep increasing. But so people what is it right jobs. now? Yeah. What is your capacity for complexity right now? And only suddenly quitting your job changes the complexity landscape. It just goes skyrocketing. And getting a business off the ground, extremely complex. So some of these things are really complex. And we see successful people, but we don't see that behind them might be a spouse who's working extra or a broken relationship or hopefully everything else working, but a lot of privilege, maybe a lot of savings, a degree, career capital. So you have to see the whole picture and yeah, we don't see the whole picture, but success is being able to take the right amount of complexity and risk like manageable. So I would say that is first one <laughs> for sure. Uh, yeah. And the second, I am a bridge builder. Honestly, I'm not so much a leap taker or that's how I've become. So the bridge between now and here and there rather than a leap from here and there uh, is my school of thought. Once you work your way, Shosh Shoshank redemption style, like you dig your tunnel. Some examples your... of bridges, like are, are, do you mean baby steps or do you mean transitions that 
with railings and handrails and safeguards yeah with transition with lot of railings safeguards like financially relationship wise parenting wise health wise when self esteem like, wise right if they've not reached the stage of ego breaking yet yeah yeah self esteem wise being prepared so i just feel that if we take it in small steps it's more likely to succeed for me that's how i've seen then put yourself in a leap and traumatize like the chances of getting traumatized are higher so i would say one step at a time wow doing it one step at least that's how i came out of my bipolar i came up, i come out of my depression so like just one step at a time just the next step just the next like the next one step one step and before you know it you're on the other side right so one step at a time i i love that you know abhishek um i hear this kindness the same kindness that you have used towards yourself and i see that kindness as you know at the heart of this approach being kind to ourselves and you use the word self traumatized right yeah there's no reason why we should be traumatizing ourselves of course yeah, yeah, yeah thank yeah. you yeah so what i had three i said complexity i said the the, small, uh, the bridges the bridges um, in transition third is yeah just stay connected to the energetic field because the universe is constantly flirting with you it's drawing your attention to different things coincidences synchronicities people showing up this podcast showing up for somebody who's listening maybe this is the message you were waiting for kind right so to be open and receptive because we tend to get into a mission mode mission mode everything will either help my mission or it's an obstacle and i'm like that narrow but there's a value to the zen mode where you're letting life happen and you're you're in a zoom out right you're looking for signs and hints and that is so much more alive non linear so much more so much more fresh Max not of mind <laughs> yeah it's really a dance then you're dancing then you're playing a different kind of max out it's not the max out of the mind it's the max out of the universe you know so that swirling that energy right so i would say connecting to that field of energy the the right coincidences will happen the right people will show up you have to trust and have faith that there is something out there also waiting for you and searching for you i would say that's my number 3 wow thank you so much abhishek thank you so much and uh, it's been an absolute delight and mm-hmm. i'm i'm just going to end with uh, i've sort of used your word max out as a th- i'll rename you max out <laughs> as a theme and you know just through this conversation and through your life i see that you know, you know the original definition of max out as the achievements of society is the doing mm. the best and and now this the max out as letting the entire universe dance mm. and yeah yeah facilitating yeah. that dance in a really max max way like a sufi yes. saint you know yes. and yes. holding that space and hats off to you so yeah you know i i mean i'm i'm a fan of just the way your life journey has evolved and i also believe it's it's such a gift just knowing that and sharing that we've definitely not done justice to it in a one hour conversation but i've just got so much out of this one hour so thank you and thank you for your curiosity your observations for creating the space for this to flow i think we were it's just the space in which this flows so thank you for holding that space loved it as well Thank you so much. Bye bye. See you. If you are someone who's looking to craft your life and work in a way that is more in line with your inner rhythm, then do visit my website www.craftingalife.com. You'll find it in the description because I have a host of resources put together for you and this is based on 20 years of my own research and work and work with people as a coach in this area. I also have a free newsletter so your starting points should be to sign up for my newsletter subscribe to this channel to stay updated for further videos and to go on to the edx site and look for my free mooc course there titled crafting realities work happiness and meaning and and then reach out to me if you need further assistance i also offer private coaching as well as i run group coaching sessions and i also conduct residential retreats and you can find all those info, all that information on my website or in the newsletter as and when we announce it